look, I want to start my message by talking about, have you ever gone through something that's unexpected? Well, look, I know a story personally uh, of this young family expecting this beautiful little daughter to come into the world. So they're expecting, they're one day walking down in their town, and eventually the mother starts getting into labor. So the father calls up the ambulance, the ambulance comes quickly, the ambulance opens up the door, the paramedics take the mother in, and then as the father is trying to walk in and put his foot in the ambulance, the paramedic says, sorry, there's no more space. And so the ambulance goes off into the sunset. And the father is left there abandoned. He did not expect to be left behind. So he's trying to figure out, how am I going to get to the hospital? Now, he starts hitchhiking. He starts getting public transport. He doesn't have a car. He eventually arrives to the hospital, gets into this long corridor where he sees the nurse at the reception. And as he walks up, he says, I'm looking for my, my wife and my beautiful daughter. And the nurse looks at him and says, sir, daughter? You've got a huge son. He's so big, you might as well send him to kindergarten. And that's the story of how my parents ended up with me. <laughs> Look, um, in all honesty, uh, my name turned from Alexa to Alex in just one day. And in hindsight, that's probably a lot better. Because Alexa would be telling the mid-argument, your Amazon delivery has just been put down on the door. So it would have been pretty awkward. Look. Why am I bringing this up? We all go through unexpected things in life, right? Maybe you're sitting in this room and something unexpected has happened to you even just in this week. Maybe you've gone through a breakup that's left you wondering about life. Maybe you've gone through a financial situation and you've got evicted from your house and you're figuring out where to find another house. Or maybe you've suffered the loss of a loved one. No matter what situation you're going through, life is unexpected. So what do I really want to look at today? Well. I really want to look at the idea of how does having God help you when you face unexpected situations? We all go through them, so how does having God really make a difference? And I'd really love to start with a story from the Bible of a character known David. You might know David as that man that killed Goliath the giant. And yes, that was him, but really before he got to the point where he defeated a giant and became a king, he was just an ordinary young man. And in the story, we see that there's this other king that's been appointed in the, in the nation named Saul. Now, Saul, unfortunately, disobeyed God and was looking more for his own benefit than for the benefit of the people. That making him a bad king, God decided to anoint a new king. And we see that our main character in the story is Samuel. And it's this prophet that previously anointed the first king and now has this commandment from God to go to a town called Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse because he has a lot of sons and one of them will be anointed as king. So we get to the story Samuel ends up in this village and he meets up with Jesse and he creates this environment where they can have a dinner together and a celebration. So he's presented with all seven of his sons and as he looks, there's one that just stands out, right? Like they're all kind of the same height and then there's one that's like two feet taller. So this guy stood out and he was known as Eliab. So he thinks in himself, Samuel, um, he thinks, surely if God's going to pick one, it's going to be that guy. I mean, he's the tallest, he's the oldest son, it just makes the most sense. But we see in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, Samuel made the, sorry, the actual word, verse, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at his heart. So it's clear that Samuel made the same mistake as the people of Israel did before. The first king was realistically only picked because the people wanted a king. And now Samuel was making the same mistake by looking at the appearance of the man instead of actually getting to know who the person really is. It's obvious that God has a different criteria of selecting a king than we do and a different criteria of looking at people than we do. So the story progresses and after he realizes that the oldest son is not really the one that God wants, he progresses onto the second son and he still gets the confirmation that no, this is not the one and gets eventually to the little guy, the seventh, and God still says, this is not the one that I'm appointing as king. So Samuel's really confused, which is fair. God promised him that one of them is going to be king, and yet he's looked at all of them, and none of them are the perfect candidates in God's eyes. So we see in verse 11, Samuel, so he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Have you ever gone in life to a situation where you felt like you were ignored? It's not fun. It is not enjoyable. But now I want you to put yourself in David's shoes for a second, right? Not only he was rejected or ignored, but he was ignored by his own family. 
imagine a situation where a large political figure from your country comes to visit your own home. Think maybe in the context of Ireland, the Taoiseach or the president. He's coming in and saying, look, I want to gather up and meet the whole family, every single one of your sons, and just have a great time and get to know each other. And your family decides not to invite you. You would feel gutted and you would be angry and justifiably so. But David wasn't. David just kept on doing his job. I know I wouldn't have been as, as wise as David and kept on doing my job if I was not invited to a family union like that. But he kept on doing it. He was being faithful. And we see in verse 12 that David is introduced to Samuel. So he sent for him and told him to be brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. Against all expectations in the story, the person that got selected to be king was the one that was ignored by the entire family, wasn't even invited to the event, and the one that maybe on the outside didn't seem to be necessarily the most qualified for the position. But I think this story really shows three things about God's nature when we face unexpected situations. I think first of all, it's really important to acknowledge that God knows our situation. We see in verse one that it says, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? God wasn't unaware of the fact that there was a political tension and the king wasn't necessarily doing his job. God knew the situation. God knew exactly what was going on. And I just want to say that if you're going through an unexpected situation in your life, God knows what you're going through. I know this was the case for me. When I was eight years old, I simply woke up one day with a huge eye and didn't know what was going on through many medical appointments and MRIs and so many different doctors, we ended up finding out that I was diagnosed with a syndrome called Arnold Carey. And if you don't know what that is, that's fine. It's a a syndrome where your cerebellum has no space to grow in your skull. And the only surgery to make you survive past the age of 11 is cutting the back of your skull open and leaving it like that for life. And in that moment, our life changed and took a turn for the unexpected. Nobody plans this sort of stuff. Nobody ever tells you that there's something coming. But at the same time, my mother ended up going through depression and losing most of her memory. And our house in Romania burned down. And it just felt like things kept on going. And bad thing after bad thing was showing up. And we didn't know what to do. And it was at that moment when he decided to take a step closer to God. We didn't know him. We had no interest in him. We didn't know why we needed him, but we decided to take a step. And you know what? God was right there waiting for us. And from the moment we took the step, our lives changed. I mean, I was healed from my syndrome. My mother's memory was restored. I've seen every single one of my family members go through unexpected circumstances, even from being a single parent in this world to now having a happy family. All of these things have changed because we took one step closer to God. And look, I just want to encourage you that if you're going through something, speak up and talk to somebody. And if it's your first time and you're not a Christ follower, I just want to urge you, there is on your table a small blue card that says next steps. Fill it in and come talk to one of our team. Because, you know, we might not have the solution for everything, but nobody wants to go through a circumstance like that alone. And whatever you're going through, no matter how big or small, feel like you have the courage to stand up and come and talk to somebody because we can point you to the one and only name that can really fix any situation and that has done that in my life. And that's the name of Jesus. Now, I think second of all, what we really see in this story that God hears our hearts. We see in verse seven that the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Look, there's nothing special about David. He was just a young man and there were many, many young men in that country that could have been picked as king. He was just a shepherd. There were many shepherds that could have been picked as king. But you know what? God saw his heart. He was faithful and working at the thing that was entrusted to him. So if you're a Christ follower in the room today, I want to encourage you, what is the last thing that God has spoken to you and entrusted in you? And are you still faithful to it? And if you are and you feel like nobody's seeing you, don't worry because God sees you. And that's what matters the most because he will guide you to your next step at the right time. And he's equipping you, even though it might look like you're just waiting. He is equipping you. So I just want you to feel encouraged that God sees your heart. And last but not least, God sees our future. Now in verse 1, again, at the end of it, it says, Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Now, God didn't just understand the situation, but he had a plan for the future. He understood that there was a young man that had the potential of becoming an amazing king and making a difference in this world. And you know what? 
We need to do the same with our youth. Yes, they, they're not prepared yet. They don't look ready yet, but that's our job. Our job is to call out the calling and the purpose that they have inside of them and to call them to that extraordinary purpose in Christ. That is our responsibility. Nobody else will do that for them. And I think the only way we can really do that is not just by speaking words, but by our actions. And I think as we act out the three things that we've hinted at today, as we first of all, when we face unexpected situation, we put our God in trust, we put trust in God, we put trust in God in unexpected situations. We teach them that whenever they are going through something difficult, God is there for them. Now, secondly, as we stay faithful to whatever calling and whatever God has entrusted in us, we show them that even when nobody acknowledges the work that they're doing, God still sees their heart. And last but not least, as we acknowledge that they have a potential and they have an extraordinary purpose in Christ and we equip them and empower them to do that, then we really will build up Jesus followers that will make a difference in this world. So there is two type of people. We have the planners. They have everything organized. They love using calendars, spreadsheets. And what I know what I'm saying this, you are probably already thinking about someone like that in your life. And then in the other hand, we have the just go with the flow people. They don't need times, they don't need dates, they just go with the flow and whatever happens, happens. And I also think we have a third type that it's like right in the middle, depends on the situation, they like to be more organized or they just go with the flow. Now, which type of person are you? If you are just go with the flow person, you've probably have some planners in your life telling you, you need to have a plan for your life. And you are there thinking, how am I gonna have a plan for my life if I can't even plan my week or my day? And I get you because I think I'm kinda go with the flow people, so I get you. Right, so no matter which type of person you are, I think we've all heard before people telling us, hey, you need to have something planned for your life. You need to plan things like college, jobs, and many other things. And sometimes you can feel the pressure from society, from your family or friends telling you that you have to figure out your future. You need to have a plan and you need to know what you wanna do with your life. Well, that's not a great thing to deal with if your answer for most of the questions is, I don't know, or at least I don't know yet. Now, I have a question for you. Have you heard that God has a plan for your life? You've probably heard this before and you just ended up freaking out because you didn't understand what they were telling you and you were just like, what do you mean with that? I, I, I can't see that plan. Well, it's not just you. I think we've all experienced this before. We've all heard these things and be like, okay, but I don't know what you're talking about, you know? But today I wanna tell you that God's plan for your life is not as complicated as you think. Today I wanna share a story with you that we can find in the Bible and we can read it together. It's in Genesis chapter 12, verse one to three, and it says, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So what's going on here? Basically, we have this guy called Abraham, and God asked him to leave his land, to leave his country, and go to a place that he would show him. Now, can you imagine this happening to you? It sounds a little bit scary. Imagine God asking you to leave your country and go to a place that you don't know anything about, you don't know the people, you don't know the language, and you don't know the culture. Probably your answer to that will be, God, can you please send somebody else? Because I really don't want to go there, right? I know. But in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, we can find Abraham's answer to this. And he said, Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed. So let's think about this for a second. God never gave Abraham the full picture of his plan for his life. He never gave him all the details, but actually God gave him his next step. The very next thing he wanted Abraham to do. And you know, when it comes to God's plan for our life, he often works like that. He won't show us the full plan, the full picture, but he will show us his next step for our life. And later on in the story, we can see that Abraham 
was obedient and he went to where the Lord was asking him to go and we can see that God honored and blessed him. So God is calling us to live by faith. Even when we don't understand what's going on or why he's asking us to do something, we can trust that he is in control and his plan is always better than ours. There is a lot of freedom when we understand that God's plan for our life is more about who we are becoming than what we are doing. And hey, we have the opportunity to obey what God is asking us to do right now. What's the next step for our lives? I don't know if you've realized about this, but we always have a plan B in case our plan A doesn't work, right? Well, with God, it's not like that. He doesn't have a plan B because his plan A always, always work. And once you decide to put God's plan as your plan A, you don't have to worry about the future. He is in control. And you will stop living an ordinary life to start living an extraordinary life with an extraordinary purpose. So now I want to share a little bit of my story with you guys. When I was 11 years old, I had to move from Venezuela. I am from Venezuela. That's in South America, right? And as you probably have seen this in the news this week, there is a lot going on there, but we believe that God is in control. So yeah, I had to move from my country with my family to Chile. It's another country in South America. And at the beginning, it was a little bit hard because we didn't know the people there. We didn't know the culture. We didn't have friends, but with time we got used to it. We made friends. We found a great church. My parents found a great job too. And with my sister, we were in a very good school. And then, after five years, God called us to move to Ireland. And we didn't understand why. We were like, okay, but we have a pretty good life here. Why do we have to move to Ireland? But, you know, we decided to obey God. And now we are here. We have almost three years living in Ireland. And even when we didn't speak English, we didn't know the culture, we, need, we didn't know the people, we decided to obey. And we've seen God's faithfulness and his promises in our life. And I want to tell you that we have an awesome God and He is so faithful to His promises. So even when three years ago, I couldn't see the full picture, I couldn't see His full plan for my life, today I can say that the best decision we could ever make was being obedient to Him because He's a great Father that takes care of us. So I would like to encourage you to trust God. You don't need to see the full plan. You just need to have your next step and focus on that. And how can you get your next step? You just have to pray, talk to God, and he will show you. So you have two options. You can follow your plan. You can make your own plan and just follow him by your own understanding, what you think it's right or could work. Or you can trust God and put his plan for your life as your plan A. You know, the first option might sound a little bit easier, but... When you decide to trust God, he will always exceed your expectations because he is in control. So if you want to start to follow God's plan for your life, here are three easy ways to start. First, seek God. It is so important that we build a relationship with God because we can't trust somebody we don't know. And the world says a lot of things about God. But hey, I want to invite you today, get to know him by yourself, like spend time with him, read his word, and you'll see how amazing he is. Second one, speak to God. Prayer is simply talking to God and he is willing to hear you. He wants to hear all your fears, all your worries, and you'll see that you'll have an amazing peace in your life. And then point three, stay in community. Life is not easy, so why do it alone? Hey, we wanna connect with you, we wanna pray for you, and we wanna do life with you. As we say here at Lighthouse, life is better connected. So God cares about you, he loves you, and even when life changes, and your plan might change too, he will never change because he is faithful and he is so powerful. So don't forget that even when God's plan might not always be clear, it will always be better so, than ours. So, My heart for you this morning and my message for you this morning is to challenge you to make you feel obliged to actively pursue God's calling for your life and to take action to seek what he has planned for you. And if you don't know what a calling is, a calling, put really simply, is just God's perfect plan for your life. And you may be wondering, well, a perfect plan, that sounds pretty good, right? I'm not a planner, so a perfect plan 
sounds amazing. Where do I sign? How do I, how do I get this perfect plan? How can I implement? How can I access this perfect plan? So we are going to go into the Bible. And we're going to go into 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 to 21. Because in this passage, there are two men. And I think that this passage really um, explains and illustrates what the cost and the weight of following your calling, but also the benefits of um, receiving your calling. So I'm just going to give some context. There are two men in this story. One is an older man, and if you don't know what an old man looks like, you can talk to Matthews on the front row right there. That's an old man. And his name was Elijah. Now, Elijah had a reputation for being a man of God. He was a prophet, and throughout his life, he had served the Lord and relayed messages and word and heart from God to the people. The second man, like myself, is a young man. Not old, very young, good looking, charismatic, confident. Okay, enough glazing. So the second man, his name is Elisha. Now, Elisha was a successful man. He was a young man, a strong man. He owned fields and oxen and he worked them. I don't know about you guys, but I could never see myself working one field, let alone like 12. Okay, this guy was really successful. But as you shall soon see, Elijah is going to challenge Elisha. So I'm going to go into the first verse here. And as I read, I'm going to break down each verse and give you my thoughts um, and what I observed from it. So here we go, if I can find it. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. As you can see, very successful and strong young man. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Now, this wasn't a normal gesture. Um, this symbolizes that Elijah is entrusting Elisha. He is calling Elisha to a purpose and to a calling that is greater than what he is currently doing. He is entrusting with him the responsibility, the burden, the weight, but also the benefit of becoming the next prophet, the next generation, and the next leader. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And he said, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. Side note, honoring your parents is good. Just saying. He's doing it. We should all do it too. So, and he said, and then I will come with you. To which Elijah replied, go back. What have I done to you? So, Elijah is challenging Elisha's haste. Because I know in my own personal experience, I tend to rush into things and be very impulsive with my decisions, which can lead to um, repercussions. But Elijah is challenging Elisha, and he's challenging his haste to accept this calling. And he basically tells him to go home and sit on it. He's like, no, go home and consider what I've just done to you. Consider what I've just called you. Consider your calling and think about it. Which is actually very wise because this is going to be a life-changing decision. It's not something that you can just say, let me say goodbye and go. Let me just pack my bag and leave. You know, it's, it's a really important decision, and it has a lot of weight to it. So the next verse, so Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. Elisha understood that in order to be fully committed to God's calling, in order to be fully committed to God's plan for his life, he had to let go of what he already had going on for him. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed or realized, but there was no way in this passage that said Elisha was doing anything wrong or anything bad. He was not a sinful man. If anything, he was a very godly man. He was a successful man, honoring his parents, working with oxen and working in fields. He wasn't doing anything wrong per se, but, but in order to accept something better, in order to accept his calling, he had to let go of what he already had. He had to let go of his old life. Whether those ways were good or bad, he had to let go. So for a moment, I'm going to just divulge um, a little story. I'm going to share something with you guys. So recently, my mother and I, we were talking, and my mother decided to um, enlighten me to a little story from when I was a young child. So I was like... 
three or four years old. And if you have children, or if you have particularly boys, between the ages of one to seven, they have like a car phase, like a Hot Wheel phase, where you just really love cars. And it's like all you care about, it's all you play with, it's all you think about as a kid is cars. I love my cars. So when I was a kid, my mom had to teach me the lesson of receiving. So when I played with my little Hot Wheels, my little cars, um, I would get all the cars. Not one, not two, I'd get all of them, or at least as many as I could carry. And I would hold them like this. I'd just be like, carry them all, cradle them, love them. But I had to learn that in order to receive a new car, I had to let go of the old car. My mom would have a new car for me, and I would want to take it, but I couldn't take it without letting go of what was in my hand. So essentially, the moral behind the story is in order to take hold of the new you have to first let go of the old. In order to take hold of the new, you first must let go of the old. You must let go of what you've already got to receive what God's got planned for you. So my challenge or my, my, my question that I want you guys to think about is what do I need to let go of? What is holding me back from my extraordinary purpose, from my calling, from my plan? And I want to encourage you guys, and I want to tell you from personal experience, when you let go of your plan and you trust God, you don't have anxiety, you don't have depression, you don't have fear because your trust is in God. Your trust and your faith is in His plan, not yours. And it may be scary for a minute to think, I have to let go, I have to lose control. But let me tell you, the best decision I ever made was not worrying about my future. It was not freaking out about the past and the mistakes I made. It was not about thinking about what am I gonna do tomorrow. It was living today and trusting God to provide for me for tomorrow. And I can tell you countless stories, countless blessings that God has put into my life, all because I trusted Him. All because I was not afraid to let go of my plans and my instincts and I was just able to freely let go of the cars, put them on the ground, and accept the new car, the better plan, the perfect plan. Wow, weren't they amazing? And that was our goal, that it wasn't just this cute idea to send up some young people, um, to put them in front of these blinding lights and everything. But we knew that God was working in their lives and they had a word for our church. And I just want to encourage you to take note of what happened this morning and to take note and to see what God has been speaking to us through all three of those messages. As Alex started, he was talking about how do we navigate life when unexpected moments happen? That life is full of ups and full of downs, but how do we rely? Do we rely on ourselves? Do we rely on a job? Do we rely on a paycheck? How do we navigate this life? But we've seen that through the story of David that he was reliance was on God. And we can do that same thing as well. And he encouraged us that God knows our situation. God hears our heart. God sees our future. And a theme that's been drawn out through each message is that God has a plan for your life. That they didn't sit down and plan it together and say, okay, you say this and you say that. But it just so happened that they brought three individual words. And the theme throughout it was God has a plan for your life. That through the ups and downs, God has a plan. He knows your situation and circumstances. And then as Fale brought a bit of her story in, coming from another land and trying to introduce herself into the culture and get to know English. Like you just spoke for 10 minutes with like perfect English. Like I'm on a Duolingo streak of like 33 days and I think my English is okay. I think I'm getting along just okay. Um, but how amazing was that to preach a whole message in English after only two and a bit years of being here? How incredible. And she tied it in with Abraham of how God asked him to go to another country. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're here from another land. And that's what I love about Ireland and I love about this church, that we have so many different nationalities in one place and maybe you feel a little bit like Abraham and you've just come here and you don't really know what's going on you haven't really got our culture you haven't got our humor you don't understand some people's accents or whatever's going on but you feel like maybe God has called you here or you've come here for a better life 
Valet encouraged us that God knows what you're going through. God knows why you're here and He has a plan and a purpose for that. And if you feel uneasy, if you feel unsafe, if you feel any of these feelings being in this new land and asking yourself, what's God's plan for my life? It was simple. She said, seek God and stay in community. Keep your eyes fixed and focused on Him. That no matter what's going on around us, those unexpected moments, seek God. And when it does get difficult, be in a part of a community that can keep you moving forward, that will support you and love you. And then Joshua sort of closed it off at the end and was reminding us of God's good and perfect calling for our life. This perfect plan that he has for us. And the challenge that was thrown out was, what are you holding on to? Maybe you're a Christ follower and you're taken back from God, the control that you've given him, that oh, I'll, I'll take hold of that area of my life. I'll take that area of my life. And what was once a, a surrender to God is now, oh, I'll take this back and taking this back. Or maybe you're not a Christ follower and you're trying to hold your life together. I can control my income. I control my family. I control all these elements. And you're trying to hold on and create a good life for you and your family. But God wants to challenge you and encourage you to surrender it all to Him. Because He has exceedingly abundantly more on the other side of your offering and your surrender. So as we think about today and the messages that were brought today, I want to leave you with this, that God has a plan for your life. You may have a plan. As Valley said, it may be detailed, it may be in a spreadsheet, it may be all planned out. But God has a perfect plan for you and it's accessible today.